I'm Maddie. I'm from ATAR Wizard, and today I am going to be going over Unit 4, Area of Study 1, Dot Point 2 of the VCE Psychology Curriculum. Now, this dot point states the regulation of sleep wake patterns by internal biological mechanisms with reference to circadian rhythms, ultradian rhythms of REM and NREM stages one to three, and the supertrismatic nucleus and melatonin. So that means we're going to be going over the sleep wake patterns that occur, the patterns that occur when we're sleeping, with reference to if they are circadian rhythms and how that's defined, and if they are ultradian rhythms and how that's defined. Um, and then we're going to look at how the symptoms in the body differ between or the physiological changes in the body occur differently between REM and NREM stages one to three, which are, um, which are parts of the sleep cycle. So we, in doing this, we're also going to look at how the supertrismatic nucleus impacts the sleep-wake cycle and how melatonin impacts sleep as a sleep hormone. I am going to be doing this with reference to our Complete Psychology Units 3 and 4 notes package, which is available via the link in the bio. Make sure you like and subscribe now so that you get updates whenever we come out with a new video explaining the Unit 3 and 4 VCE Psychology curriculum, because that here at ATAR Wizard is our bread and butter. So let's get to it. So we're starting just here. First off, we have circadian rhythms, which refer to the changes in bodily functions that occur over approximately a 24 hour cycle. So what happens from midday to one day to midday the next day, or from 6 p.m. one day to 6 p.m. the next day, that is going to be our circadian rhythm. So it's occurring over a 24 hour time period. Then we've got our sleep wake cycle, which is a kind of circadian rhythm. Now, this is the person, this is the process of us being awake and asleep. And how this repeats over a 24 hour cycle. This is influenced by internal factors such as sleep hormones of melatonin and external factors such as light levels, which we look at next when we look at the SCN. So the supertrismatic nucleus regulates the sleep-wake cycle. The sleep-wake cycle. So this is the supertrismatic nucleus, or the SCN, is dubbed or called often the body's biological clock, which regulates the sleep-wake cycle. And it's located in a part of the brain called the hypothalamus. So this is a part of your brain. It's called the hypothalamus. Inside the hypothalamus is the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Now, later we'll look at the pineal gland, which is separate to these things. The process of the suprachiasmatic nucleus regulating the body's sleep wake cycle is as follows. Now, this is important. There's likely to be a question on a SAC or an exam which asks you how the suprachiasmatic nucleus regulates the body's sleep wake cycle. I'll just grab a drink. I had orange juice before, but she's, she's nearly empty now. So, you need a different colour pen. Number one, or the first step, is the message of a change in light level travels through neural pathways from the retina of the eye to the suprachiasmatic nucleus. So the retina of the eye is a bit at the back of our eyeball. And through neural pathways, so along the neurons, the neurons fire, and this carries this message from the retina of the eye to the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And that's step one. Step two then occurs where the suprachiasmatic nucleus uses the information transmitted from the retina to the suprachiasmatic nucleus to decide if the body should sleep or if it should wake up. If light levels are high, this indicates the body should wake up or stay awake if, if you're already awake. Whereas if light levels are low, this indicates that the body should go to sleep or stay asleep if you're already asleep. Or if you are in bed and you have a brief period of awakening in which you open your eye. So the suprachiasmatic nucleus then sends a message to the nearby pineal gland, which is responsible for melatonin release. 
Now, melatonin, and we look at this below, melatonin is the body's main sleep hormone and its presence assists in the initiation and maintenance of sleep. So if serotonin is secreted into the bloodstream, this will increase tiredness or help you maintain sleep. So if light is higher, the message that is sent from the superior matic nucleus to the pineal gland indicates a decrease in secretion of melatonin. So the superior matic nucleus, so sorry, sorry, so the pineal gland wants to decrease the level of melatonin in the bloodstream because the light level is higher. The suprachiasmatic nucleus will also initiate an increase in body temperature and the release of cortisol. This is to help you wake up because the light level being higher indicates your body desires a period of wakefulness or your environmental factors are indicating that your body should wake up, like the sun's coming up or your light's turned on and that's indicating that it's morning. So your body temperature will increase Cortisol will be released and there will be a decrease in the level of melatonin in the blood. And that is what is going to promote wakefulness. Cool. So alternatively, if the levels of light are lower, this message will indicate to increase or maintain melatonin in the blood. And this cortisol release and body temperature increase won't be it won't occur because you're trying to stay asleep. Cool. So again, here, melatonin, the body's main sleep hormone and its presence assists in the initiation and maintenance of sleep. Now, ultradian rhythms are cyclical changes in the body which occur in a span of time under 24 hours. Now, an ultradian, uh, a sleep cycle is a kind of ultradian rhythm which refers to the cyclical movement of the body through the four stages of sleep being REM and NREM and REM one through three. It takes approximately 90 minutes per sleep cycle. So it's important to remember sleep cycle is ultradian. Whereas from up here, our sleep-wake cycle is circadian. Perfect. So here this is represented visually. So this is our 24-hour time period going around, going around like that. And here is our time of sleep and here's our time of wake here and here and you can see how that alternates throughout the 24 hour period and because it occurs over approximately 24 hours that's going to be a circadian rhythm where is here we have our singular sleep cycle and that is going to be ultradian because it's under 24 hours it's occurring multiple times under 24 hours. So one cycle is going to be like cycle seven, cycle six. There's multiple of these cycles, whereas here that is showing only one cycle occurring over 24 hours rather than the sleep-wake cycle. So the sleep-wake cycle occurring over 24 hours. So one cycle is approximately 24 hours, which means that it's a circadian rhythm. Is a sleep cycle occurs multiple times within a 24 hour period, which makes it an ultradian rhythm. Moving on to the stages of the sleep cycle. So we've got NREM 1, 2, and 3, and then we've got the REM sleep. So identifying what characterizes each of these stages of sleep is really important. Often there'll be questions in Saxon exams about differentiating these types of sleep and it's really important that you can super quickly identify how you're going to differentiate these different stages and how exactly what you're going to write. It's good to just have go-to examples. So we're going to go through some of these now. So new pen color, I reckon. And we've got NREM1. My cat is at my door. I will be back. We have NREM1 which is when sleep onset occurs through this stage, except in infants. Now the hypnogram that is shown below in these notes shows it, it onset through REM, which is how it, which is 
where, sorry, so infants have their onset through REM rather than NREM1. This is depicted in the hypnogram in the page below, which we'll get to in a second. So you can just note down that that's through REM. Now, NREM1, people feel like they're drifting off to sleep. They lose a sense of their surroundings, but can be easily woken. So that bit where you're kind of still thinking about things in your head, but you're not quite asleep yet before you go to bed, that is going to be the NREM1, NREM1 stage. So my cat again. Now, during the NREM1 stage, your heart rate decreases, your body temperature decreases, and muscle tension decreases. And it lasts for approximately five minutes. Both these physiological responses and the amount of time it lasts for are really, really good examples of how to differentiate the different stages. So just write that. So NREM2 is a light sleep. It lasts for 10 to 25 minutes and lengthens in each cycle as sleep progresses. Now, body movement, temperature, and blood pressure continues to decrease. Breathing becomes regular and eye movements stop. NREM3 follows this. This is the deepest sleep stage. The body is at its maximum level of relaxation. There are hardly any movements and the heart rate and blood pressure are at their lowest, which um, people are very hard to wake up in NREM3. So if you wake, walk into someone's room while they're sleeping and they don't wake up, that's a good indication that they are in NREM3 because they're very deep into sleep. They're really, really not aware of their environment around them. Um, less time is sleep, less time is spent in the NREM3 stage as sleep progresses. So as you get further into the night and you've been asleep for longer, less time is going to be spent in that NREM3 stage. Now, REM, rapid eye movement, um, 20 to 25% of sleep is spent in this stage. Your eyes are going to move rapidly. So that's a really good indicator of the REM sleep on the EOG. You can note that down there. And also, as we're going through this, it's really important to think about what from the first stop point, whether the EEG, the EMG, or the EOG would be the best way of differ differentiating these different physiological responses, which occur as we're sleeping and differ between these cycles, because you're likely to get questions about how the different responses on those what on those on the AAJ, the AOJ, and the AMJ, as well as sleep diaries and video monitoring, you're likely to get response get questions about how the measurements on each of these devices will differ between sleep stages. So it's good to think about that when you're thinking about the physiological differences between the sleep stages. So brain activity is high in REM, which if you think about that, that would be the AEJ, because that detects, amplifies, records the, and records the electrical activity in the brain, which would show, which so increased measure, so increased measurements would show that brain activity is high. The heart rate increases and becomes more irregular. Blood pressure and breathing rate also increases during REM. So another really good point of differentiation. Individuals are often twitch in the in the REM stage and the REM sleep periods tend to get longer and closer together as sleep continues. So last of all, we have the hypnogram, which is how often sleep cycles are represented in a hypnogram. So um, this hypnogram is not a super great example. It's actually really helpful if you look up different hypnograms online and then you can look at how they differ between sleep stages and a lot of textbooks also have a lot of examples of different hypnograms. So these are graphs used to describe someone's night of sleep. Now, if you look at this hypnogram and think about what st what age this person might be, which we look at in the next episode, you can tell that they are an infant because they have sleep onset through REM, which is not typical of adults. That only happens in babies. And then you can see how their levels of deep sleep, so this, sorry, infant. You can show how their levels of deep sleep decrease as they go on in the night. And then finally they wake up at about hour six, which 
again is probably an infant would sleep for longer than that but that's but that's um again look look up different hypnograms on the internet and often that gets you really good at identifying identifying different kinds of like different ages of people while they are sleeping so come back next episode or next video and we will be looking at unit 4 area of study 1.3 which is demand for sleep across the lifespan which we've sort of touched on at the end of this session again you can purchase these notes wait i need to unplug them the same thing happened last time you can purchase these notes which you can use digitally or you can print them out and they're super cool you can purchase them via the link in the bio you can also get one-on-one -on -one tutoring sessions with me which i know i'm biased but i think are pretty fun and we can go through these topics together and obviously do in-depth questions and practice questions and anything else you find really really helpful for this but best of luck studying make sure to like and subscribe and again you can find those links for everything i've just mentioned where it's tutoring or the notes you can find that via the link in my bio and i look forward to seeing you again next time bye